Good morning, everybody. Hey, if you do not know who I am, uh, I am Casey Winstead. I'm the lead student pastor here at Geyer Springs, uh, and I have the privilege of bringing today's message. Uh, We are continuing in our series, The Art of Neighboring. I believe this is the fourth week. We had uh, a week of graduate recognition, and then we had a a week of celebrating mothers. And so I think this is the fourth week. If it's the third, uh, I apologize. But as we continue this series... Over the past few weeks, we've really dug into the idea of who is my neighbor. And for me, I know that I've become more aware of opportunities to serve my neighbors, uh, more aware of opportunities to meet my neighbors. Some of you may have figured out that your neighbors are weird, uh, and they do things that are not normal. And the attempts that you've made to connect with them, and you're like, now I know why we haven't done that yet is because we probably had that one conversation at the mailbox and we just knew it was gonna be awkward and weird and things like that. But my hope and our hope as the staff as we have led this out through this series, this art of neighboring, is that we're aware of the opportunities that we have for neighboring. Not just the people that you live next to, but the people that you do life with, the people that are in your community. And so it's that being aware and being an intentional manner and mindset in which you approach being a neighbor. And so last week we looked at the importance of time and investment. Just like all relationships, it takes time and it takes investing. It's not just like you instantly know everything about every single person, but it requires time and maybe sharing a meal or or maybe helping out with a project and things like that. But we also looked at how busyness is something that can stop us in our tracks when it comes to neighboring. Pastor Dave talked about how we love to push the garage door button and we go in and then push it and close it down. Or, or we're always constantly going and maybe, maybe there's a cookout and you've been invited but you've got this thing going on or there's a, there's a sporting event or something that you have to be at and so you can't fulfill the, the duty of neighboring because of other obligations. And so we have to be aware of our schedules and we have to try not just fill them up but instead, leave some margin in there. Leave some time for us to be able to just kind of chill out. I know that at my house, a lot of times what we do, and this is pretty common, is that we just like to be around people, friends and family and things like that. So if there's time for us to hang out, we're going to do that. But the reality is, is when we fill up our schedules, or we have these practices, or we have these things going on, is that there's not a lot of margin for us to just be able to be good neighbors or us to just stop and talk to the people who live around us. And so this morning, what I want to look at is the idea of neighboring to all people. I think it's a common misconception in the church that our role as Christians are to surround ourselves with other believers and stay inside of that community model. And you may be like, well, no, that's not what we believe, but that's what we do. Whereas we want to surround ourselves with people who are like-minded. We want to do things with people who worship the same God that we worship. And I believe it's important to be in fellowship and in community with other believers, but it can't be an exclusive thing. And see, the problem is that we begin to put off this feeling of elitism or that we're better than others. It's not intentional. It's just how we come off. Because we have the greatest thing ever But as a non-believer who doesn't understand the power of Christ in a relationship with Jesus, it kind of comes off a little bit arrogant and things like that as we approach life with confidence. But what I want us to do, and I personally feel like it's one of the biggest downfalls of Christianity in the Western culture, and we feel as though, like, if you're not a believer, like, you don't belong. And you you may not say it with your words, but we think about it with our actions, the way that we treat people who are non-believers, maybe the people who act differently or act out, or do inappropriate things, and we silently judge. We're like, well, at least I'm not like that. Or maybe you have that neighbor who loves to have late night parties, and they invite everybody over, and they're not inviting you, and then you're mad. And you're like, why? Well, maybe you shouldn't be so self-righteous, right? Maybe you shouldn't be so judgmental towards them. And we do this, and we silently put off this idea that we think that we're better than people. Could you imagine if that was how Jesus operated? Like if his heart for ministry was to go after people who looked like him, people who talked like him, people who believed like him. And I love this because what we do is if you disagree with me, like not only are you wrong, but I can't even be in the same room with you. You guys realize that? When somebody has a differing opinion, maybe it's on politics, maybe it's on religion, whatever it may be, we're like disgusted, right? 
We're like, God, what an idiot. That person's so stupid. We do this. We think that to ourselves. What if, what if that's us? Like, maybe we're so stupid. Maybe people think that about us. Like, yeah, Casey, that opinion, that's a, that's a dumb one. That's a bad opinion. But we think that we know best. And we treat other people poorly because they don't agree with us. Could you imagine if that's how Jesus operated? Like in ministry. He's like, well, do you believe? And they're like, not really. He's like, bye. That's not how he operated. That wasn't how Jesus functioned. And I'm thankful for that because every single one of us are born sinners. And Jesus says, you're not like me. You're not like me at all. Why why should I be around you? And you can think, when I said that, you instantly thought of somebody. You're like, that's the person. He, he knows exactly who that is in my life. You know what? That needs to be someone that you pursue. That needs to be someone that you love. You're like, I can't be in a room with that person. I can't even be in the same state with that person. Hey, you know what? Like, that's not how Christ would operate. Luckily, that was not the model or the mindset that Jesus had. Instead, Jesus knew that he had a responsibility to serve everyone, no matter what, not based upon location, like a socioeconomic status, not color of skin, not political opinions or thoughts or beliefs, whether they believed in him, whether they would accept him, whether they would deny him, Jesus did not care. The way that he operated was to love every single person. And so what I want to do, if you guys have your Bibles, I want you to open up to Luke. Uh, Today will be one of two things. I will prove to you how well I am at reading, and obviously the English language struggles on me uh, with that last sentence, but I can either prove to you how good I can read, Or you're going to be like, hey, buddy, why don't you stick to like one passage? But I I, I want to share some things with you. So the first is found in Luke chapter 19. Luke chapter 19 is the story of Jesus and Zacchaeus. And so as we've heard this story, we are familiar with this, but I I just want to read it just really quick. In verse 1, it says this, He entered Jericho, and he was passing through, and behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus. Now, instantly, y'all are like, yeah, the wee little guy. He climbed the tree. I know about that guy. What kind of tree did he climb? Why does that matter? We all know that detail. He climbed the sycamore tree. We're like, okay, he could have climbed a pine tree. It didn't matter to me. And then like people, like scholars, and and these people be like, it does matter because you can't climb a pine tree like you can climb a sycamore tree. Here's all that matters. We're familiar with the story. We even know what tree he climbed. But he says this, he was a chief tax collector and he was rich. So far, so good. In verse three, it says this, he was seeking to see Jesus He wanted to see who Jesus was, but on account of the crowd, he could not because he was small in stature. Now, I don't know if that's offensive today, but that's what my Bible says. Verse 4 says this, so he ran ahead and he climbed up in what? The sycamore tree. He wanted to see him, for he was about to pass that way. And in verse 5 it says this, and when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and he said to him, Zacchaeus, he said, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. Verse 6, he says, so he hurried and he came down and he received him joyfully. And when, he saw, and when they saw it, they all grumbled. He has gone in to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. Oh, that sounds like something we would say, doesn't it? Do you even know who you're hanging out with? Are you kidding me? Look, I go to church every Sunday. You don't come to my house? And we got good food here. You're going to hang out with that guy? Are you kidding me? And so he says this. You, it says that he's gone to be the guest of a sinner. And in verse 8, it says this, And Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I restore it fourfold. If you don't know what that means, it's four times. And he says this in verse 9, And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, since he also was the son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. See, while this may be a familiar passage in the Bible, I think a lot of times what we associate this story with is like Sunday school and children's church. We sing the song, we know the motions, he's a wee little man, he climbed the tree, he looked. Like, we know that. We do that. Some of you are still singing it from the first time I mentioned it. But that's kind of where we leave it. it. It's a beautiful picture of Jesus and the love that he has for all types of people. Not only love for someone who looks like Christ or someone who desires to know him or someone who even desires to go beyond the initial point of contact. Like Jesus takes it a step further. He's not, hey, Zacchaeus, love you, man. That's not what scripture says. And what we have to do is stop feeling good about the connection. 
Whenever Pastor Dave was like, hey, I want you to meet your neighbors, you're like, I can do that. And you see him, you're like, hey, buddy. And that was it. You said it. You're like, man, I feel good. I'm going to email Pastor Dave. Dear Pastor Dave, I saw my neighbor and I smiled. Sent from my iPhone. Like, that's it. That's what you did. You sent it and you're like, I feel good about that. Because the old me didn't want to talk to them. I just didn't. And what we do is we feel good about the connection and we leave it there. We're like, hey, I did my job. What would it have been like if Jesus, passing through this cow, he's like, yo, Zacchaeus, I see you. That was it. That's the end of the story. Do you know what doesn't happen? Zacchaeus doesn't run out of the tree. He doesn't go and have dinner in his house with Jesus. Salvation does not come to that house. But what we do is we're like, I see you, man. I see you. Ah, yard's looking good. Nice. Is that a new truck? Like, we're like, whatever. We say anything. Hey, weather's great. How about them hogs? Like, that's it. And we feel good about that. We're like, I talked to him. I said like four things to my neighbor this week. Surely salvation will come. Right? That's not how it operates. What we have to do is while it's great to make the connection, we can't celebrate that. Like the celebration comes at the secondary connection where the meal happens, where we invite them into our houses, where we go over there and do a project with them and it goes beyond talking about the weather. I can literally talk to anybody on the face of the earth about anything. It's a gift that God has given me, but it doesn't mean that it's going to lead to a spiritual conversation. Because I talk to students and you know what? They love everything. It's weird stuff and it's normal stuff and it's stuff I've never even heard of. And it's just like, oh, tell me about your life. And then I begin to hear it. I can do that with adults too. You'd be like, why do you know so much about this? Because I'm good at pretending I know about so many things. I don't. I'm just a good listener. And then I kind of regurgitate some things back. I'm like, wow, that's how that plant stayed alive? Crazy. And you fed it what? Water. Oh. Like, <laughs> just, this is normal stuff. But I can't be, like, happy with that. That's not, I've not been called to be someone who interacts with people on, a, like, a, a one connection and then drops it. That's not what it's supposed to be. We have to then take the steps that follow the introduction. And I'm not saying don't be excited about waving at your neighbor or like, yeah, cool boat. Or like you don't talk bad about that lady who lives next door for one time, right? Or you get cut off and you don't give them the finger. Whatever is like your win that day. Like don't be happy with just that. Like what we have to do is take it a step further and say, okay, but I've got to make a meaningful, lasting connection. And so this is where it's important for us. Jesus did not just settle with talking to Zacchaeus. Jesus was ready to move on to the next step. The next thing, check the boxes and make the connection. But it's important to understand, Jesus knew exactly what he was going to do. You have to be prepared with a plan. Don't just be like, ah, maybe it'll happen. No, like, be prepared. Like, hey, how's it going? We would love to have you over for dinner. And they may be like, oh, sorry, I'm busy. But at least you had a plan and you weren't like, oh, are you hungry? Like, it's close to dinner. Like, like have a plan. Be prepared. And so instead of Jesus just, just going and saying, hey, Zacchaeus, like, what's up? He says, I'm coming to your house. I'm sharing a meal with you. This made the religious community upset. They were frustrated that Jesus and a crowd of people, probably religious people, would pay attention to the man that was considered so terrible, chief tax collector. He was a crook. And Jesus is like, I want you to come down here. I want you to be in relationship with me. And so my question is, is do we find ourselves in this position where we get upset with the needs the church is trying to meet of specific things that may get a little bit messy? Like what happens if somebody comes into the, the doors of Geyer Springs and isn't dressed the nicest? I mean, up here we're like, we don't care. Like, come on. You should go up to the venue. And maybe that's what they say downstairs. Oh, we got a service for you. Go upstairs. You're going to fit right in. But think about that. Like church culture is come dressed a certain way, look a certain way, play a certain part, sing a certain song, do this certain thing. Like, is that how the spirit leads? And I'm not telling you to do something different. But what I am saying is this, is that we can't be so judgy 
on what people do because God is presenting us opportunities. And so many times we have this box of what it has to fit in or it doesn't happen. It just doesn't. And it's one of the biggest downfalls of the church. Oh, like, I, we, we, man, we love people. And we want to live, we want to love, we want to reach. If it's not messy. Like, what happens when we're called to love the least of these? What happens when we're called to love somebody who does something that I totally disagree with? Am I just going to be like, no, my Jesus is not for them. That would be terrible to say. But we do it all the time with our actions. And so my challenge to you guys up here and whoever is watching this online, hey, we can't be put in a box when it comes to taking the word of God and the gospel message and going out. I don't care what you look like. I don't care what you act like. I don't care the choices that you make. The gospel is for you. And we have to stop just being like, eh, maybe not. No, no, no. It's for everybody. It's for every single person. That's exactly what Jesus did for you. So why would you selfishly hold on to it? I say, I can't share this with others. Another time in scripture that we see Jesus was more focused on ministry and, and not the perception was in Luke chapter five. So if you flip over just, just a couple chapters, Luke chapter five, starting in verse 27. You guys there? what it sounds like up here, a bunch of, bunch of pages turning. It says this in verse 27 of chapter 5. It says, after this, he went out and he saw a tax collector named Levi. Now, these tax collectors were marked people in society that nobody liked. Sorry if you're like doing audits and things like that. It's still about the same, okay? <laughs> but he's sitting at the tax booth and he said to him, he says, follow me. And leaving everything, he rose and followed him. And then it says, and a Levi made him a great feast in his house. There was a large company of tax collectors. So it was like the whole firm, you know, they're all here. They're all hanging out and others reclining at the table with them. And the Pharisee and their scribes grumbled at the disciples. Now remember the Pharisees and scribes are the religious leaders. And so they say this, why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? I really wish Jesus would have just like, and this is like my like earthly heart would have just kind of punked him out and been like, I eat with y'all sinners, but he doesn't. And that's why I could never be him and a few other things. But in verse 31, it says, and Jesus answered them, those who are well have no need for a physician, but those who are sick, he says, and I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. And I love this model that Jesus goes after in the church. What we do is we focus on the needs of us. And he says, it's outward. It's not an inward thing. We are here to grow and to shape ourselves, but it's not just to continue to serve ourselves. The two big takeaways from this passage and the one with Zacchaeus is look at the people that Jesus surrounded himself with. They weren't always the ones that had their stuff together. And the other thing that you notice is how the religious people felt about Jesus's choices. They made it known. These scribes and Pharisees are like, are you kidding me? You hang out with tax collectors and sinners? The crowd grumbled whenever Jesus was going to hang out with Zacchaeus, the chief tax collector. And if we aren't careful, we can quickly become a group of self-righteous churchgoers who ignore the calling of God in our lives. See, in this passage in Luke chapter 5, we see that Jesus came to the environments that the religious leaders thought were inappropriate. And what he did is not only did he show up and say, hey, how are you doing? But he made a connection. And so they thought it was inappropriate and he spent time with these people, but the people that we may consider a little bit sketchy, but those were the people who needed him. So this morning, I wanna leave you with a few thoughts before we wrap up. The first thing is this, is that we are not called to comfort. We're just not. We want to be comfortable. We need the air to be a certain temperature in here. Can't be too hot, can't be too cold. These seats, some of them are a little firmer than the others. Some of y'all sat on a pew down there and you're like, man, if we could get rid of these. Like, we want to be comfortable. We, we, we want to feel safe. We have security in here so that people are safe. And while I appreciate all of those things, sometimes that becomes the focus of the church. You guys realize we're not called to comfort? Jesus wasn't like, hey, worship me if it's comfortable. 
And then it's the whole Jesus juke where it's like, you think the cross was comfortable? <laughs> Probably not, right? And as we think about that, Jesus says, I need you to be obedient and faithful. There is a limited time. Don't worry if the conversation is uncomfortable. I'm going to prepare the way. I'm going to make these connections. I'm going to help you out. See, God didn't send his son to the earth to be put to death as a sacrifice for our sins so that we could just be comfortable, so that we could come in and complain about the music's too loud or, or the lights are too bright or, or there's, was there fog one time? Like we get so caught up in silly stuff that really doesn't matter. The color of the carpet. Somebody spilled coffee one time. Like let's riot. Like that's not what we're called to do. And I understand being a good steward and taking care of the things that we have. But man, we make minor things major things in the church. Comfort is the enemy to the advancement of the kingdom of God. One of the biggest reasons that we don't share with others about Jesus is our fear of the unknown trying to avoid the awkward situations. Did you guys realize that scripture tells us like it's their blood on our hands. That person doesn't know who Jesus is if I had an opportunity to have that connection. I tell students like, man, y'all are so worried about being judged by people. People are already judging you. At least do something good to be judged by. Oh, what if I, what if I don't know what to say, Casey? Like, man, you're a pastor. That's easy for you to say. Yeah, I, is it? <laughs> like, it's still hard to share the gospel with strangers. It's really hard to share the gospel with people that you love, people who you're going to show up to the next family get together and they're still there. But you know what? I'm not called to comfort. I'm called to be faithful and obedient and take the message of the gospel and then share it. And if somebody else thinks it's awkward, sorry, I'll pray for you about that. But I don't want to stand before Jesus, stand before God. And he's like, hey, man, what about this, this and this? Why didn't you tell that person? I, you, I, you live next to somebody for five years and you knew their name and that was it. We cannot go through life justifying not sharing the gospel, not telling people the good news. It's not the role of a pastor exclusively. It's the role of every single Christ follower. And the sooner that we figure that out, and I'm not like calling anybody out this is to me too. My job as a husband, as a father, as a neighbor, forget pastor, is to lead my family well and to lead those around me well. That's what I'm called to do. That's what Jesus has put upon my life. It has nothing to do with standing here today. Every single one of us are called to that. And if you don't enjoy that or that makes you uncomfortable, I'm sorry, but like work at that. I wasn't asked to teach and make you feel comfortable. Now, there's plenty of churches around that would love to make you feel comfortable when it comes to the words that you hear from the Word of God, but I would strongly encourage you to be careful to sit under those teachings because Scripture warns us of the people who teach things like that, who try to deceive you and, and make you feel a certain way. Here's the second thing that we have to take away this morning is that we are called to care. We're not called to comfort, but we are called to care. And see, caring is something that is evident. At least it should be whenever you meet people. Do your friends and family know the things that you're passionate about? Most of the time they do. They can follow you on Facebook or Twitter or Instagram. And they're like, oh yeah, Casey, he loves Razorback baseball. And if you live in my house, I'm so sorry. They know. I'm they say angry, I say passionate. It's a fine line. It's a gray area. It depends. Did we win or did we lose? And that'll tell you. I'm going to be honest. Yesterday, my day was slightly ruined. I was like, hey, two runs, we got this. Bing! Walk off. And, and Katie probably didn't even know the game was on. I was listening to it on my phone, like on the radio. But she probably knew, like, my demeanor changed. She's like, yeah, that was the time. Right there. We're like, oh, upward soccer, celebration, come home. Sad. I was like, uh, I guess I'm going to go mow the yard or something. I don't know. Like, we know what people are passionate about whenever we meet them. But how often do the things that you're passionate about line up with the needs of others? See, my passion for Razorback sports, and, and some of you, this, this may ruin your day, okay? It doesn't matter how hard we cheer. It does not affect the game. We're like, oh, no, no, but these are my lucky underwear. Like, we always win when I wear these. Turns out, and I'm very stitious, okay? Doesn't matter. It doesn't. I can't like will a team to win. 
Trust me, I played on lots of them that lost. I tried. I was like, oh, these are my lucky socks. Didn't matter. But so many times, our passions do not do anything for anybody. What if my passion was for people who don't have homes? What if my passion was for people who don't have food? What if my passion was for people who've never heard the good news of Jesus Christ? And my family knew that. And it's like, hey, when we have leftovers, it's like, why don't we find somebody to give these to? I'm passionate about that. That would look different, wouldn't it? Like family, like let's go out and find somebody who needs a meal. And so many times, you know what we do? We see people who are panhandling or whatever, whether they need it or not, and we instantly grumble. We're like, they're just trying to get money. They probably have a nicer car than me. Like, those are things we say. How do we know? I saw him get into it. Well, okay, besides that time. Like, how do we know the needs of these people? We're just like the scribes and Pharisees who were like, like, no. Give me something else, God. Have a conversation with one of those people. Hey, you know, like, tell me about your life. Tell, tell me wh- what got you to this point. What I want to be is a man who my passions are passions that actually make a change in the world. There's not an amount of college wins in any sport that are going to get me there where it helps other people. And that's something that I have to realize, especially when my daughter's like, hey, daddy, why do you yell at the TV? I'm like, I I don't know. (laughs) It just happens. And so if there's dads out there who do that, like your kids are totally watching, we need to form a group. Maybe Matt can talk to us. We can get this figured out. We can settle this, Uh, whatever that looks like. But we cannot be people who are so judgy. We're not called to judge people, but so often that is our first step. We're actually called to care. Here's the third thing, is that we are called to humility. When I tell people, what is humility? Listen, it's thinking better of others than yourself. It's it's that simple. How do I put the needs of others above my own? How do I find what people need and then help them out? See, humility is something that I think we could all use a little bit more of. If you're, if you're familiar with sports, athletes always like write, like in baseball, they write like a Bible verse if they claim to be a Christian on their hat. Or, you know, Tim Tebow did it with like the eye black. And, and so for me, on the bill of my hat every year was Philippians 2, 3. And you're like, that's weird. But the scripture is do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility, consider others better than yourself. And you're like, well, that doesn't line up in sports. But my heart was always, man, I'm better than this person. I'm going to strike this guy out, or I'm going to do this, and and I'm going to elevate myself. And what I realized is that it's not about how good I am in the sporting field. But how can I meet the needs of others, and how can I think more highly of other people? See, we have been called to humility. So do you answer the calling to humility, or do you just continue to put your needs above others? And here's the final thing is that we are called to imitate Christ. We're not called to comfort. We are called to care. We are called to humility. But ultimately, we're called to imitate Christ. Think about the way that that you neighbor. And and it's a thought-provoking question. But if I'm trying to look like Jesus, when was the last time that I was hanging out with people that would make religious people uncomfortable? And you're like, oh, I did that last night. But I made the bad choices. But when was the last time that you hung out with people that make religious people uncomfortable for the sake of the kingdom of God? When was the last time you invited one of those people to church? When was the last time you invited one of those people into your house for a meal? You don't have to invite them into your house. You could do like the safe thing and like the cookout. You're like, I don't know. They may want to kill me. Hey, driveway, you know, speed dial. Like, hey, listen, I know a police officer. Just say something like that. Probably going to back up a little bit on the whole like, murder your neighbor thing, right? I'm just kidding. I don't think any of us have that. But here's what I say is that so many times we want to imitate Christ. And I think about my kids like I want them to imitate Christ, but I'm not imitating Christ in my life. So how can I ask them to do something that I'm not willing to do? Jesus was always around people that made religious people nervous. Here's one last passage that I want to read. It's found in Luke chapter 7. And so in Luke chapter 7, starting in verse 6, we see this, this, again, it's like a party taking place, this gathering taking place with religious leaders. And in verse 36, it says this, one of the Pharisees asked him to eat with him. And he went into the Pharisee's house and he reclined at the table. See, he did eat with other sinners. 
And he said this in verse 37, And behold, a woman of the city who was a sinner, when she learned that he was reclining at the table of the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask of anointment. Now, whenever they usually say that a woman of the city who was a sinner, uh, that is code for she was a prostitute. This, is, this was her job. This was what she did. So everybody knew exactly who she was. She found out that Jesus was at the house of a Pharisee, and she goes in there. And she comes in there with an alabaster flask of anointment, and standing behind him, at his feet, she is weeping. Picture this, a woman, terrible sinner, weeping at the feet of Jesus. And then standing behind him, she began to wet his feet with her tears. Do you realize the amount of tears that have to come out of your face to be able to wet someone's feet? And then she wiped them with the hair of her head. You want to talk about humility? This is it. This woman is crying at the feet of Jesus and then cleaning his feet with her hair and her tears. And listen, if you don't like feet, you can cover your ears. And then kissed his feet and anointed him with the ointment. Now when the Pharisee who had invited them saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would have known what sort of woman this was and who was touching him, for she is a sinner. And Jesus answered to him, he said, Simon, I have, said some, I have something to say to you. And he answered, say it, teacher. He's like, come on, like that was in my head, like Jesus doesn't know what I'm thinking about. He says, a certain money lender had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii and the other owed 50. When they could not pay, he canceled the debt of both. Now, which of them will love him more? Simon answered, the one I suppose for whom he canceled the larger debt. And he said to him, you have judged rightly. Then turning towards the woman, he said to Simon, do you see this woman? He says, I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet, but she has wet my feet with the tears and then wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but from the time I came in, she has not ceased to kiss my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, with oil, but she has anointed my feet with ointment. Therefore, I tell you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven. For she loved much, but he who is forgiven little loves little. In this passage, we see this religious leader. He was being a skeptic. He's intrigued. He invites Jesus over to the dinner. So we have this banquet in a courtyard, and a passerby or wanders by a woman who is a sinner. Remember, we know what she did. And she heard Jesus is teaching and was overwhelmed by his love. So she uses her expensive perfume, the most valuable thing that she has, to anoint the feet of Jesus. She says, this is my way to make a sacrifice to you. It's a sign of respect. And then she kisses his feet, indicating this utter humiliation. She kisses the unwashed feet and then pours herself out of love and gratitude. And Simon says, listen, if you were a prophet, you would have known this. He never would have let this happen in public is what Simon's thinking. And Jesus responds to Simon's thoughts. He says, listen, you have a person, a denarii is a day's wage. He says one owes 500 and one owes 50. He says, which one, if both of them are forgiven, would love me more? And Simon knew where Jesus was headed in verse 44 when he says, do you see this woman? But see, Simon couldn't see past this woman's past. And so the question this morning is, as we call the, the worship team back up is this, is that, how can we ever truly love someone the way that Christ intended if we can never see them the way that Christ did? Think about the people that you surround yourself with, the neighbors that you live around. Do you see them through the lens of what Jesus did? Do you see them with love? And you say, I love you so much that it may be uncomfortable, it may be awkward, it may be weird, whatever, but I want to let you know that I love you and I care about you. See, part of being a neighbor is not thinking so highly of yourself, but it's how can we meet the needs of others. And so this morning, I want to pray to close this. And for some of you, maybe you just have to stop thinking so highly of yourself. Maybe for some of you, the, your prayer this morning needs to be like, hey, Lord, can you just humble me? Can you put the needs of others above my own? Some of you have some serious issues with loving people who are unlovable. You, you see sinners and you're like, I can't be around them. Why not? Like, stand firm on the love of the Lord and understand what is right and what is wrong and then minister to the needs of those people. That is what we are called to do.